Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this afternoon's COVID-19 Professional Education Quickenar. My name is Matt McDonough. I'm going to be the host of today's event, and on behalf of the ESRD NCC, uh, we want to welcome you to this afternoon's event. Uh, so let's jump right into it. We only have 30 minutes together, so let's go ahead and get started on this afternoon's event. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about what this call's about next. Uh, after that, I'll introduce today's speakers, uh, Dr. Dale Lupu and Dr. Elizabeth Anderson. Um, their topic today is going to be on how dialysis staff can help patients maintain emotional well-being during this COVID-19 pandemic. And at the end of their presentation, we'll pause uh, and look at our questions and answers panel and our chat panel, uh, where hopefully you will be submitting questions for our speakers to address this afternoon as time allows. Um, so we'll go ahead and get to our next slide. And what is this call about? If you've been on these before, you know, uh, but it's an opportunity to hear from stakeholders in the community uh, who are adapting to COVID-19 in a variety of practice areas uh, and to get some real world strategies for facilities to put into use. Uh, and as you know, we do these weekly on a variety of topics. Um, so I will, without further ado, go and introduce our two speakers this afternoon. I'll start with Dr. Elizabeth Anderson. Um, she's practiced as a hospice and palliative care social worker, bereavement coordinator, and social services director for the Mid-Atlantic Renal Coalition. Um, she's a 2018 Sojourn Scholar Award recipient through the Cambia Foundation, uh, and she's one of the first of two social workers to receive this award. Uh, Dr. Anderson is passionate about how to empower healthcare teams to provide the best patient-centered care and supportive care by infusing social work skills with a focus on empathy and evidence-based communication skills training. Uh, our other speaker, Dr. Dale Lupu, is an associate professor, associate research professor at George Washington University, where her current research is in integrating palliative care into nephrology care. Her four decades of experience building the field of hospice and palliative care has been motivated by the conviction that the end of the story matters. As the former CEO of the American Board of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, she guided formation of the physician subspecialty of hospice and palliative medicine, and has also served as a member of the CMS Hospice Payment System Technical Advisory Panel. It gives me great pleasure to introduce and to turn the floor over to our two speakers. And welcome to everyone who's participating. We hope this is going to be a valuable and refreshing uh, 30 minutes out of your day. So I want to start with a story. Liz and I have been spending a lot of time recently on calls with our colleagues in the nephrology world, hearing what's happening. And we it's so different for our colleagues in the Bronx in New York City and our colleagues in rural Wisconsin. A lot of variety of experience. But the one thing that is constant, I well, there are two things that I hear that are constant. One thing that is so obvious is the commitment that people feel towards taking good care of patients. And the second thing that we hear is that the stress levels for everybody are through the roof and the stress is taking its toll. Uh, staff are irritable, patients are irritable, and then you get friction. So we want to help you go back to some of the first principles around how can you help everyone retain their balance and get back to a zone of emotional resilience. So just one quick beginning story of hearing from one of our colleagues, a very talented nurse practitioner in a dialysis center in, Ma in Manhattan. And she has been working with us on how to integrate more goals of care conversations into their regular practice in their dialysis center. And she said, I recall this, uh, she was both angry and like almost tearful. It was just, there was a deep sense in her voice of, I'm in a mask. I'm in, I'm in a face shield. I'm in, I'm, I'm in, you know, I'm gloved, I'm gowned. My patient is in a mask. How can we talk to each other and have a real conversation? So just to acknowledge that the situation we all find ourselves in creates ba barriers that are beyond anything we've dealt with recently, um, and that there aren't 
answers to it. So just to acknowledge that, that there's a lot of unknown, but there's also a lot of innovation that's happening, and we want to support you in going back to first principles, applying those, and looking for the ways that you can innovate and apply them in new ways as you learn how to cope with the pandemic. So the two big takeaways we hope that you will take away, there are two of them, and these are first principles. Oh my gosh, you've heard them before. But when in dealing with emotions, the important, the most important thing you can do is give your patients or your colleagues an opportunity to name and express that emotion to you, to someone who is listening with presence who says, I can tolerate this difficult emotion. That is what is healing. Another person with you, helping you see, understand, and express the emotion. So that's takeaway one. And takeaway two, and man, I know you've heard this before. If your well is dry, you don't have a lot to give your patients. So taking care of yourself and of your own emotional balance is part of taking care of your patients. Just You've heard it before, just saying it again. So let me um, go to the next slide. So sometimes there's a sense that if you name this stress, this anxiety, this fear that people are carrying into the waiting room, carrying into their dialysis chair, that you're going to increase it more. But just to remind you that that's not true. People carry those emotions with them, and if you don't talk to them about it, it doesn't make the emotion go away. It, it becomes sort of that untalked about elephant in the room that takes up a lot of airspace. So what do you do? You lean in. And that's where this invitation to patients to share their concerns comes in. That's how you start. You invite people with one of these sometime statements or some patients have concerns. I've heard from some patients that they're really quite afraid of what's happening or that it, this is very unsettling, all the changes that are happening. That's a lean-in statement. That's an invitation. Liz, you want to take it from here? What happens after that invitation when somebody says, yes. yeah, I'm scared? Yes, yes. So, um, you know, I think then what happens to a lot of us in the healthcare field is we have this deep desire to fix right? Like we're out there doing this work because we want to make people feel better. And our initial reaction when people share things like I'm angry or I'm anxious or I'm sad is like, oh my gosh, what can I do? Let me grab you some tissues. Let me call all these support providers, um, et cetera. And, and while those things are important, what we also know is one of the most healing things we can do is to provide empathy. And for the purpose of this presentation, when I'm talking about empathy, I'm not just talking about being nice. Um, I'm talking about using language that expresses your understanding of people's emotional state. Um, and so really finding the words, using the emotional words that you think a, a person is experiencing and kind of giving that back to them. So we're not fixing it here. We're just checking out that emotional response. And so I wrote an example uh, in that middle part. Sounds like you have been fearful about what might happen to you and your family right now. There's a lot unknown right now and everything is changing so fast. But really focusing on that fearful piece so that when I'm hearing these stories for patients, I'm thinking in the back of my head, what is the emotional process going on right now and helping our patients name that? Um, that's really what empathy is. It's not feeling sorry for people or joining them in that, but it is tr really trying to get that deep understanding of their emotional response. So as Elle said, we're gonna invite them in to share their concerns. And then we are going to practice empathy. And then the third skill we want to talk about is fostering resilience. So the idea here is, again, we all want to make fix it for everyone. We want to make it better. And our tendency is to think to ourselves, I know how to do that for you. Let me tell you how. But what we really know from all of the patient-centered principles is that people 
actually often know how. They're just in the middle of a big mess and they can't find it. But if we can help them find their own coping skills, their own coping skills are going to be much more effective at creating healing than us telling them what to do. And so fostering resilience is really about asking our patients, what has helped you get through this before? And I think it's important to note the dialysis patients have already been through lots of difficulty in their life just by virtue of the fact that they are dialysis patients. So they, they have already developed some coping skills. They are already resilient in some regard. And I think reminding people of that is important and leaning into that. So what has helped you get through this in the past? Now, of course, some people are going to say things like, well, the things that helped me were going to the movies and seeing my grandchildren, and I can't do that right now. And that's okay, we can lean into that too. Um, but sometimes that means we have to push it a little bit further. And what do you think other people have done? How does your community and the people around you, how do they deal with things like this? But we're really eliciting in this um, stage. Okay, next slide. So in thinking about how to apply this, uh, Dale and I talked a lot, and we've heard a lot from patients and providers about this fear and anxiety is really grounded in a fear of death. Um, and, you know, at the, at the bottom of all of this, this is what we're all concerned about, not just our patients, but we are also worried about our own loved ones, ourselves, et cetera. And so we wanted to give you some words around that because you've got so much going on, we want to, we thought, Let's just give a couple of slides that give you exact quotes of how you could say this. Um, and so in this first slide here, we're using a case scenario of talking with patients that have had another patient die in the unit. So knowing that other patients have died, how do we handle that? Um, the first thing goes back to the very beginning and what Dale said is that we have to acknowledge it. When I teach family therapy to students, one of the, the most important things that I tell them to take away is that family secrets really cause a lot of problems. They cause a lot of anxiety and disruption. And in, in some ways, a dialysis facility is like a family. And when we don't talk about it, it just creates and festers more anxiety. Um, so we want to acknowledge the loss. Um, because if we don't acknowledge it, we're not talking about it, we can expect that patients actually are going to get more anxious, more agitated, and more upset. So this is almost one way that we prevent some of that is leaning into that. And so we've just got a quote here of, you know, we're like family, I have some difficult news to share with you. Given how much I care about each of you, I wanted to tell you myself. But unfortunately, Mrs. S has died. So we've just leaned into that and shared that news. And again, just like we talked about earlier, we want to resist the urge to fix. And we just want to pause and let the person respond. And go back to that empathy statement that we made earlier. Pay attention to what that emotional response is that your patient is having and use that language. Um, and so, after you've gotten a sense of that and you've listened to them a little bit, coming back with another statement of this is heartbreak. And you can share your own experience. It's heartbreaking for me too. But we're using that language. Um, it is okay to be upset or even angry. We're here to support you and listen. We may not know the answers, but we're in this together. And I think that last statement is really important because, A, the patients are having this emotional reaction whether or not you're journeying with them or not. But what is healing for them is to have a safe place to share that. And so if they know that you can tolerate their negative emotions, they can have a safe place to put some of that um, which can help them feel healing. 
What's not healing sometimes is if we're asking a lot of questions, it's not often healing to give advice. Um, what is healing is to help listen and articulate those feelings. Okay, next slide. Similarly, if we look at patients who maybe have had a loved one die, um, a family member that is, has died, we want to use the same skills. So A, again, we need to acknowledge that um, and lean into that. We recommend in doing that a couple of things. One, use their loved one's first name. Um, so if you can make that statement personal, that means a lot. Um, if there's something you remember about their loved one, include that. So, you know, Linda always had the most cheerful smile. I could always tell that James loved you. Making, you know, when you're acknowledging that emotion, when, when a patient has suffered a loss, being able to call those things out is important. And again, going back to that pause plate. Place, letting the person respond, naming that emotion. So hold it, pay attention to, to what you're reading from them, and then respond with that empathetic statement. It's so heartbreaking. There's your emotional word and great loss for you to bear. And finally, in doing this, really, again, letting the person know that you are a safe place to talk. A lot of times what happens when we, the clinicians, can't tolerate negative emotions, we will sideline the conversation or we'll say something nice, ask a question, or we will intellectualize it. We'll talk about it in a really intellectual way without touching on the feeling part. If you want your patients to know that you're a safe place for them to talk, then, then you know, I think the statements like we have here Something like this can make a person feel overwhelmed, angry, and devastated. You are safe to talk with me about any of that. So having said that, we also think it's really important that you exercise these techniques on yourself. So just like how Dale opened with um, the Self, how important it is that you take care of yourself in this time, I think that those things have to apply to us as well. So acknowledge that you have your own emotional capacity. Um, acknowledge that you uh, acknowledge your own emotions in that. And using some of these strategies to work through that for yourself is going to help you um, help your patients as so with that being said, Dale, you want to take us through the next part? Next slide. So on the next slide, we've talked about words. We gave you some words to use, but now we're going to say, forget about the words we gave you. <laughs> because really, we gave you those words because sometimes that's the hardest part when talking about death is people just don't know what to say. So we gave you some words and some principles. But really, it is simply about your presence, about being there, and of course, presence while you're in PPE and patients are in masks and sitting six feet apart, it's harder to convey. But people have very well-attuned emotional receptors, and they pick up when you are caring and, and intending to be of help to them. Most of the time, people pick up on that. So taking an extra moment to even say to someone, I wish right now you know, that I could sit down beside you. I wish I could take your hand. Um, I'm doing that in my heart or I'm holding you in my heart you know, as you go through this difficult time. However it feels natural to you to convey your presence, that's really the important thing to do. Next slide, please. So we've heard from um, some VASA centers about activities or, or ways that they memorialize and, and have rituals for acknowledging death. Is there anything you want to say more about these? No, I just think that, again, you all have to find your unique way to do that um, and what feels right in your facilities. But uh, this slide just kind of goes over lots of different ways that you can do that, putting a flower in the chair of a person who's died, um, having a bulletin board with obituaries, 
um, different rituals in the unit um, and being able to send cards to the family. And I'm sure you all could probably school us on some other ways too, but it goes back to, again, leaning into that and knowing that our patients really, it's, it's a respectful show to them, uh, to the people that are surviving as well, acknowledging that loss too. So with that being said, um, we want to really acknowledge that you all are doing such important work right now. Um, you all are walking alongside lots of people who are suffering, and you're also doing that at a time where you too are having to experience a lot of suffering. And just to reinforce that self-care piece, I think a lot of times we all feel like that is um, selfish of us, like how could I possibly take 10 or 15 or 20 minutes away um, from my family, from my work, from people suffering. And I think it's important to remember that those aren't just 10 or 20 or 30 minutes for you, but you are giving the people around you a gift when you take care of yourself because you're going to be better able to be present. You're going to be better able to tolerate that negative emotion that you have to handle, and you're going to be better able to listen. So remembering that self-care piece is important to you and that kindness is important to you. Um, being kind to yourself and empathetic to yourself um, is important. And um, just thank you so much for this work that you do uh, walking along, alongside people um, that, are, that are grieving and dealing with all of this and knowing that you have um, more skills in your toolbox to use. Um, Dale, anything you want to add to that? I just want to share one one of my favorite 10-second practices for self-care is to what I call to myself, rest my eyes on beauty. So for 10 seconds, 15 seconds, look out and find something that is beautiful. Um, it could be the way the light is glinting on the dust in the, in the window. It could be the color in someone's shoe, but just the idea is to rest in the beauty for 10 seconds. So I just share that with you. And I know each of you probably has your favorite practices. That's one of mine. So I think we're ready to open to questions and see what people would like to talk about or share. We are, and I do have uh, three or four questions here. But before I ask a question, I just want to share a comment that came in. Um, one of our attendees uh, said that uh, they wanted to let you know that this presentation has really hit home uh, because they have been struggling mentally and emotionally since this started. Um, mm -hmm. And they've reached out for counseling and all the things that you've said they've been working on with their counselor. So you are right on and they really appreciate you sharing this information this evening. Wonderful. And can, can we just say back to you, um, bravo for recognizing that you could kind of fill your well with some help from other people, and we support you and I honor you for for seeing what would help you fill your own well. That's really that's really brave. And it is a strength to know how to go get help. I mean, it really is a strength to be able to seek that out, and I think all of us uh, need to practice that right now. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. All right, um, I'll, I'll ask a few questions and then we can answer as you feel appropriate. Um, first question came in and says, uh, what suggestion do you have for how supervisors or managers can support their staff who are uh, being taxed helping patients feel less stressed, like they're sharing that burden of their patients during these times? I think it's used exactly the same principle. Mm -hmm. Go to staff, what about this is really getting to you and and try to have a little time where you move away from the logistics you know oh i've had to redo the seating plan 17 times if, if that's how someone responds to you that's fine we'll say we'll we'll talk about the seating plan another time but wow i can hear your frustration you, again name the emotion and pause name the emotion pause and it sounds silly but it is helpful just that 
is helpful. Take a breath. The person will usually take a breath with you. And that's helpful. And then from there, if you, you need to get people out of what we sometimes call the lizard brain, which is the emotional brain. And naming it is what helps us get a little tiny bit of distance, not drown in that emotion. And it's only then that we begin to engage our higher thinking, our cognitive thinking skills. So that's, that's one tip I would have to supervisors. Is, and again, we're, we know that you know, there's no time for two-hour support groups. Well, may, maybe you can. But it, in, in the absence of that time, you know, it's, it's a five-minute conversation where you let somebody, you help someone name what they're experiencing and you tell them, I'm here with you in that experience. Mm -hmm. I help you hold it. And I think if you're really in um, a facility that is dealing with an awful lot of this, one thing that we're hearing is um, different healthcare organizations establishing buddy systems so that everybody who works in the organization has someone who's sort of checking on them and that they are also checking on. So, you know, my job today is to be checking in with Dale. She's going to be checking in with me. We're going to have our eye on each other. Mm -hmm. So there's a question. I see a question about can we do this one about helping patients process another patient's death, a fellow patient's death, while protecting the patient's privacy. Mm -hmm. So um, what we just heard today that one network is going to be resending out some guidance about proactively asking patients what they're willing, what they want to have shared about them. And it's not just death. I mean, sometimes people leave a facility. And go to home dialysis or go somewhere else. So asking patients, you know, what they would want to have shared. Um, the other point is that if things are public like an obituary um, that's been in the paper, you, that's not a violation of HIPAA to share that kind of public information. And then when you're talking with the patient, if you make the focus to the patient, well, what do you remember about Mrs. Ash? You know, I, I know you sat together, you know, for three years. You're, you had chairs. So I would say, what do you remember about her? That, then you're not violating privacy. You're, you're going, again, to what is that, the, the living patient, their, what is their experience? What are they missing? And then, of course, often it goes, for them, it goes right to the expressed or unexpressed, I'm afraid I'm next. And um, again, naming, wow, this, is, this can be so scary for all of us. Well, I'm glad you actually addressed that question. We had two other questions specifically were about, you know, HIPAA prohibitions and whatnot. So that proactive initiative uh, seems to be a way to uh, address that. So thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, another question that came in. Um, I understand, and, and actually this one hits home with me because I, I sometimes have this problem. I understand what you're saying with being present with the patient, uh, but sometimes the silence is uncomfortable. Um, how do you get over the feeling that the silence is uncomfortable and, and perhaps not helpful? You want me to tackle that, Dale? Um, I, well, can I, I do an exercise with lots of my students where we spend um, in pairs three minutes listening to another person in silence, and then we switch. And almost universally, what people report from that experience, so the list, it's the listener usually who has trouble being quiet, but the person who's talking reports that they feel more heard, and they are able to go to depths and express themselves in ways that they wouldn't had the person jumped in right away. Liz, what would you like to say? I would reiterate that and, and also just add that a lot of times people are silent because they're processing and they need, I mean, uh, if you're going to come to me with something really heavy, I sometimes need a minute or two or five to really think about that. And, I, and so I would reiterate what Dale said is, you know, that oftentimes the listen, we're the ones, the listener is having the struggle here, but not the patient. Um, and being able to offer that safe place, really just reminding ourselves that that is an important place for them to. Um, so I, I would say do an experiment next time you have the opportunity and really stay with your own discomfort and just see what happens if you really, really wait. And the other thing is that different cultures have different amounts of time that they consider appropriate 
gaps um, between speakers. And so sometimes if you get a New York fast talker with a, <laughs> um, let's say somebody from the Navajo culture where they they expect long pauses between speakers, that's considered respectful. That it can be really different. <laughs> you know, um, so, and listen. The other thing I would say is listen when you're listening to your favorite pieces of music. Listen for where the silence is and notice how silence communicates. So start getting start 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 exploring quiet and silence. And I think that goes back a little bit to the whole body language piece, which of course I realize is more challenging right now because of PPE. But, you know, they say that 70% of what we communicate is not actually in the words that we use. It is in our presence. And when I've talked to patients in the past, oftentimes they literally use language. Like if I say, tell me, what, how do you want providers to give you difficult news? They will literally say, give me your ear. Sit down with me. Um, and so a lot of that is like how you hold your body in that silence and how you're leaning in and and taking that, I think, is part of it, too. Uh, it's excellent advice. Thank you so much. And, and we've actually come up against the end of our event, so um, I just want to take this opportunity before we wrap up to Thank you again. I uh, received a number of positive comments on this uh, request for the slide deck, which we'll talk about in a moment. So um, we really, really appreciate you tackling this topic and sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you. Thank you. You are very welcome. All right, we'll go ahead to our next slide. Before we wrap up today, we do want to talk for a moment about the kidneyhub.org. Um, this is a new resource for patients and for, prof for professionals. Um, it is a secure, mobile-friendly web tool, and it was developed by the NCC with assistance from our patient subject matter experts. Uh, it currently has links to important research uh, resources, such as COVID-19 emergency resources, uh, network contact information, patient-created resources, educational materials, uh, and it's being enhanced with new features all the time. It is designed to be viewed on a smart device or a tablet, so we encourage you, if you have a moment, to go out and visit thekidneyhub.org, uh, take a look around, and instructions for bookmarking this are available from the site menu. Uh, our next COVID-19 Quickenar events, uh, these save the dates, are here for our patient-focused event. It is May 12th, 2020 uh, at 5 p.m. Eastern, and our next provider-focused event is one week from right now, well, 30 minutes ago right now, uh, at May 13th at 5 p.m. Eastern. Both of those events are published and available for registration at www.kidneycovidintrocenter.com. Uh, so please be sure to go visit that site, take a look at these and other upcoming events, uh, and we hope that you would register and that we'll see you on a future event. Um, so we're going to wrap up right now. We just want to say thank you. Our contact information is here if you'd like to get in touch with us. Uh, as well as additional COVID-19 resources for patients and providers through the CASER website, which you see on your screen. And again, our COVID Info Center website is www.kidneycovidinfocenter.com. Uh, again, thank you so much for attending today. Thank you for your attention and your time, and we hope to see you on a future uh, COVID-19 webinar. Have a great evening.